people he was dying for. They weren't worth it. You and I weren't worth it. The word of God tells us we weren't worth it. It is by grace that we are saved. Now let me explain and so you can understand what grace is. God's unmerited favor towards men. And what is God's unmerited favor towards men? For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but would have everlasting life. That's God's unmerited favor towards us. We didn't deserve it. How do I know we didn't deserve it? Romans 5, 8. But God commended his great love for us that while we were still sinners, the Bible says, Christ the Messiah, the anointed one, died for us. Now let us go a little further into that while we were still sinners. Understand this, when Jesus Christ died, he died for the sins of the world. Past, present, and in the future to come. We weren't worth it. That's why God's grace uh, is what saves us. It is by grace that we are saved, not of works that we might boast. Because what is there to boast in your flesh? The Bible says there is no good thing that dwells in the flesh of man. Lord have mercy. But one man who caused us to go into sin. And when I say one man, note this. I'm talking about mankind. The Bible says Adam. But yeah, the Bible also says he named them both Adam. Get out of this here blame game. We spoke about that last night at Sunday Breakfast Mission. Too many times, and this is the division, this is the work of the enemy to cause you and I uh, 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 to have a division between ourselves and one another. Between the man and the woman. God says that they shall become united and become one flesh. But when you start pointing fingers at and, and blaming that the reason why uh, we're in the state that we're in is because of what the woman did. It's because of what they both did. They both were wrong in what they did. She, in allowing the devil to speak to her, well, first off, no, before the devil even spoke to her, she, in allowing herself to get enticed by looking at that tree in a way that she had no business looking at it. Because when she looked at it the way she looked at it, she found out that she wanted to touch it. She wanted to see how it felt. That's called the lust of the eyes. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. The man, he blatantly disobeyed God. Why did he do that? He chose someone else above God. Who was that someone else he chose, Minister Wesley? His wife. They both fully understood what God said, that the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. They knew what that meant. They knew there was going to be a natural death that was a, a, inevitable that was going to be coming. Uh, the Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die in Ecclesiastes. But then they also knew that there was going to be a spiritual death. And that was going to be instantaneous. Because when you go further into Genesis, the third chapter, you find that God eventually had to clothe the man and the woman properly because they were improperly clothed. They tried to do a cover up on themselves and they couldn't do it. God created the first sacrifice for there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. He made he made a, a, a clothing for them out of skins, y'all, of an animal. Somebody died and blood was shed. And then after he clothed them, he dispatched them from the garden. They lost their spiritual connection. They lost their spiritual relationship with God that they had shared with him from the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I ain't talking about Genesis. Jeremiah 1.5 Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born... I consecrated, I set you apart, and appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now that part in, that, in, 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 in uh, Jeremiah 1.5 where he says, I consecrated and set you apart. The Holy Ghost illuminated the mist me to me. Oh my God. Illuminated this to me earlier. And that was before I got into um, the reading of God's word. Let's go to Genesis uh, 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall become united and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. I submit to you, this is God's consecrating and setting apart of the man. 
or mankind, man and female, because it ain't just the man that leaves his father and his mother. The wife has to leave her father and her mother as well. Again, we're speaking about mankind. He set them apart. He set them apart, consecrated them, and brought them into holy matrimony. And verse 25 said, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not embarrassed or ashamed in each other's presence. Oh, do you know how to help someone along the way? We're in Romans, the 15th chapter. And, and, and yeah, the Rome, the letter epistle of Rome by the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. Paul had a great desire to visit this church. This church, I, oh yeah, I was I talking about the day of Pentecost. Yeah, when the Bible says, yeah, there was a, yeah, I explained the 11, uh, what happened to the 11 disciples, uh, and I said there was 109 more, making it 120. Amen. Understand this, a disciple, y'all, a disciple is nothing more than a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had many followers, amen, that were disciples. And so, therefore, this 109 made with the 111 that he had picked, amen, made up the 120. Now, besides them, because this was a feast of the Jewish, of the Jewish faith and of the Hebrew culture, uh, the, 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 the dispersion, the Jewish dispersion, if you will, what is known in political science, scientist terms as the diaspora, they gathered from all the known places of the world where they were populating. And in that gathering, they came to Jerusalem, but they didn't come by themselves. No, they had been proselytizing. They had been witnesses, converting people to Judaism. So they brought their proselytizing lights with them. Uh-huh. The Bible says that when the Holy Ghost fell down on everybody in that place, amen, they were endowed with power. And then everybody started speaking in the various languages and dialects from where they came from. And everyone understood everyone. And then, when you do deductive study of God's word, you realize that after the day of Pentecost had passed, and everybody returned from whence they came from, it is believed, y'all, it is believed that there was those that left from that day of Pentecost that established the church at Rome. The Apostle Paul didn't do it. But what he always did was to help establish them in their understanding, in, the, in their relationship, in the faith. So he wanted to visit them, but he couldn't. He had done three missionary journeys to the church at Corinth, and he sat down and wrote this letter to the church at Rome. And we're in the 15th verse, first 15th chapter, the first verse. We, we believers, that's who we're talking about. We, who are strong in our convictions and of robust faith. Oh my God. Do you know what it means to have a robust faith? Amen. That's somebody that's joyful, happy about being who you are in the Lord and he in you and you in him. Oh, my God. I'm just happy, happy, happy. Everybody be happy. Oh, my God. Yeah. Ought to bear with the, uh, the failings and frailties of the tender scruples of the weak. We ought to help carry the doubts and qualms of others. Not to please ourselves. Now, understand what it's talking about when it's talking about the weak. It ain't talking about somebody that can't fend for themselves or nothing like that. It, it, it explicitly goes here and explains. We ought to help carry the doubts and the qualms of others not to please ourselves. And what are they weak in? They're weak in their faith. They don't have that robustness that we got. They don't have uh, uh, the conviction that, that a strong, mature Christian has. And, but, but, but God has given us a responsibility. He told us that Man needs help on this earth. And we are helpers one to another. And here we go, verse 2. Let each one of us make it a practice to please make happy his neighbor. What you talking about? Please make happy my neighbor. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, man. Oh, no. You're going a bit too far with this. Oh, my God. Make, 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 make a practice. To please make happy my neighbor. I want to be happy. I just want to be happy. Happy. But when you have the mind of Christ. For God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for the world. 
And if you and I are in Christ, and if we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we are allowing that mind in, in us to be at, let that mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus, then each one of us ought to make it a practice. That's right, a practice to please make happy his neighbor. Why do we have to make it a practice? We have to learn how to do this, y'all, in order for it to be a part of us. Because our nature, that's not what we do. We please me, myself, and I. We know how to do that. We don't know how to help someone along the way. Lord help us. Uh, make happy his neighbor for his good and for his true welfare. Not for your good. You ain't doing it for yourself. You're doing it for your neighbor. And his good and his true welfare. To edify him. To build him up. Not build you up. Not to get you walking around talking about, oh, look what I'm doing for so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Many of us do that in the body of Christ. That's a testimony that a lot of people have. Oh, I did this for brother, sister, so-and-so. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't know what to do. But then I, 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 what? We can't do nothing outside of the will of God. Matter of fact, God gives us the will to do according to his good purpose and his pleasure. We don't even have the will to do anything on somebody else's behalf. It has to come from God. Lord, help us. Uh huh. Do you know how? Do you know how to help someone along the way? For Christ did not please himself. Gave no thought to his own interest. That's another thing. Now, now I'm going to go to another scripture here in a minute. But I have to go back to Philippians, the second chapter, the, the fifth through the eighth verses. That's what that's all about. Christ didn't think about himself. He gave up himself. He died to himself. And watch this. We're going to go on. But as it is written, the reproaches and abuses of those who reproach and abuse you fell on me. Who did they who did they abuse? God. How did they abuse God? They sinned against God. When you sin against God, you are abusing God. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's all different types of abuse. There's sexual abuse. There's physical abuse. There's emotional abuse. By way of the Holy Ghost, I'm introducing to you another abuse that's even greater than all three of them. That's a God abuse. Abuse to God. And how do we how do we abuse God? When we disobey Him. We are abusing Him. That's our Father. That's our Creator. That's the one who thought it wasn't robbery. To be have equality with his own self. That he gave up himself. So that he can. Oh my God. So that he can come and save wretches like you and me. <clears throat> and we abuse him. When we stay outside of his will. When we, go, when we are disobedient to his word and to his commandments. Jesus Christ said if you love me. If you love me. You obey me. You, you obey my commandments. And follow my instructions. Uh huh. Uh, let's go to Psalm 69 and 9. And then I think we're going to end up back in John, the second chapter, the 17th verse. But we want to go to Psalm 69 and 9. Let's get an understanding about what he said about uh, 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 the reproaches and abuses of those who reproach, reproach and abuse you fell on me. Psalm 69 and 9. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for joining us, uh, Robin Brown. Praise God for you. Uh, Romans 69 and 9, uh, you find this word. For the zeal for your house has eaten me up. <laughs> and the reproaches and insults of those who reproach and insult you have fallen upon me. That's right. For the zeal for your house. And what was he talking about? Well, when you go back to John the 15th, I'm sorry. When you go to John the second chapter, yeah, let's go to John the second chapter. 
Um, we're going to go to the 17th verse, but before we go to the 17th verse, I'm going to read some verses preceding that, because that will help explain to you what he was talking about when he says the reproaches and abuse for my house, for your house. Uh, uh, we're going to help you understand it right, right there. Amen. And this is what you find in...